Um, so this person that I, as our guest speaker, Monica, uh, not only does she, is she the director of operations for the Cotto Group, um, and you may or may not know that uh, we have also launched a virtual assistant business, virtualleverage.com. Um, I've also started to uh, venture off into coaching. I currently coach 18 agents in our market center. I do have a couple of clients that are outside of our brokerage, um, and I'm I am probably taking on three clients uh, in the beginning of 2021. And so Monica helped me with that as well. And then uh, we're just diving into escrow business as well. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Monica uh, Lopez to uh, this call. Thanks for taking the time, Monica. Why don't we, uh, why don't you just start off and just let people know who you are and uh, what exactly do you do? And what was your background before we joined forces? Good morning. Um, let me start with background. Why don't we do that? Um, trajectory since college has been um, managing a law firm. I went into nonprofit housing and advocacy with Maldef. Then I went into more housing um, with a company where I was at for 14 and a half years, we started doing uh, a combination of affordable housing and workforce housing. Um, as times changed, as government programs changed, we evolved. By the time I left five years ago, we were doing uh, luxury real estate, multi-million dollar homes. Um, you know, I still keep in touch. So the last project, which I think was still just getting started when I left five years ago, finally closed uh last month and it was like a 35 million dollar home so there we ran the gamut from affordable housing to luxury homes mm -hmm. so when i came to cotto group i thought i knew a lot <laughs> turns out i didn't know enough about the real estate desk itself so i had to learn standard contracts listing agreements what you know what the life cycle of an escrow is all of that from scratch uh, learning from you and Jessica. Uh, last, last Monday was officially my five-year anniversary. So started out uh, as EA, learning the contracts, learning what to do for listings, learning to read your mind, learning to read Jessica's mind. Uh, my strong suit was on the HR side. So being able to onboard new agents, helping the team grow, um, helping with accountability, helping with... Um, our team meetings and I think team standards and sort of our culture, that was another strength that I brought with me was events, mm -hmm. um, being on the chair of a national board for another nonprofit before. I kind of done it all is what it felt like, except for the real estate desk. The, how that's evolved is, as you said, you know, you like to tell people, you don't know what I'm doing, you have no clue, and that's true. Um, we've been able to systematize a lot of what we do um, as times change, as our software has changed, CRMs change, rules change, advertising rules change, car forms change. We've just, we have a system ready with checklists that are easy to update when something changes. We have a system for onboarding agents when, it, when we add to our team. We have a system for when someone decides to, they need to leave our team. I think we've got pretty much everything set up. Now we just modify as times change. When uh, when you interviewed, when you responded to the job ad five years ago, you were currently employed. I was. What was missing in that environment that made you want to, or what made you want to apply for the job? And had you been looking for a while? That environment, you know, after 14 and a half years, like I said, we started with workforce housing. Um, I had come from the nonprofit world. I'm still, I sort of, I still have a foot in the nonprofit world. So to me, it's about fair housing for all, equity, government accountability, things like that. When the company shifted from that into just straight out luxury real estate, there was no more, to me, it, for, for my, um, I guess from my soul, there was no more heart in it. It was just mm -hmm. a beautiful house that was going to be purchased by an investor who was never going to live in it. 
and there was no, there was just no gratitude from anyone. It was just a transaction. Mm -hmm. um, and I had also, because I had, I had evolved into all of these different roles, I was working probably close to 80 hours a week. Mm. So I was kind of at the end of it. It was like, I, I just didn't want to do that anymore. I had to find some balance. And when mm -hmm. I read the job description for the EA for Cotter Group, you know, I was reading it and I was going down a list of like, that's me, that's me, that's me. I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. That's me. That's me. I can do that. And there was nothing about the job description that said, nah, pass. So, and the funny thing is I thought about it and I thought about it and I looked at it a couple of times. And what happened is, you know, on, on ZipRecruiter, you can tell who's been looking at your ad and you actually reached out to me. <laughs> So when you started, uh, what were some of the biggest challenges? Because um, at that time, I was in production, right? And, uh, you know, I can't recall five years ago what, how, what our team structure looked like, but I know we had a handful of agents on the, on the team. Uh, what, did, what did that look like from day one prior to you coming in? Was the job ad, was it accurate? I mean, did, did it kind of spell out what you were in for when you did take a seat at the at the desk and kind of let the dust settle and observing and processing and learning um, was it what you thought you know coming from HR I know a, a job description can only tell you so much it tells you what your duties are not how you're going to carry them out not how challenging it's going to be to carry them out or anything else but it did specifically tell me what I would be working on, which was real estate mm -hmm. transactions, uh, on you know putting systems together for, to help the team grow. Um, I was not prepared to take on the team meetings. I didn't know I was going to be doing that, but thankfully for me, that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so challenging was just you know the learning curve, also the fact that it's not like in other industries where real estate agents are sitting next to you all day long and you can ask questions. You guys are out in the field, you guys are doing showings, you guys are doing the open houses. So being able to maximize the time that I had with people in the office. And then the other challenge was learning what the transaction coordinator did, the, how that correlated with what I did. So it was just a day by day process. Yeah. How are you, how were you able to be successful with the Cotto group? You have to find someone who can sort of figure some things out for themselves, but they still need guidance. So if you correlate it to new agents in the market center, what I've seen at Keller Williams is new agents come in and everyone's willing to help. Everyone's willing to pitch in. We do inner circle. They mm -hmm. can, you know, walk into anyone's door and ask a question because they've never done this before. And agents are, you know, eager to help. Everyone here is always helpful. If someone has a question on the Facebook group, everyone has an idea of how to, how to address it. Well, the administrative assistant or the director of operations, it's the same thing. They come in just like that new agent. They don't know. They know how to use Word. They know how to use your calendar. They know how to use a laptop and Google. They don't know how you like your calendar to look. They don't know, again, correlating it to agents. When you have a listing and you get multiple offers, every agent writes their offer differently. So you can't assume that your assistant knows how you like to write your offer. So it's a matter of either preparing ahead of time. And I did have some preparation. Mm -hmm. When I joined, the first thing you did was you sent me a copy of the MREA. Um, you sent me a link to what we already had as far as operations, mm -hmm. um, which was a living document that we were using. Um, you immediately included me in team email. And then I was invited to an event. So part of it is osmosis. Mm -hmm. But the other part is having that little bit of preparation. And then my first week, it was calendared. We calendared. I spent two hours with Jessica as she was working on an offer, as she was working on a listing agreement. I spent two hours with Jess and two hours with our TC as uh, listings were being entered into the MLS. I was able to ask those questions. Um, I'm also a really good note taker and I'm an avid note taker. Mm -hmm. So my, you know, I know you laugh at me, but I always have different colored pens and highlighters because they all mean something. So as I'm taking my notes for the MLS and see how Jessica likes to do things, 
I'm highlighting the different sections. My notebook basically at the end of that day looked like a printout of the MLS. Mm -hmm. Because then when I went back in, I knew where that checkbox was. I knew what she liked to check. I knew exactly how she likes to, to word her private remarks. And so I actually still have that notebook. It's st sitting right behind me here. I can pull that out and give that to my assistant and say, here's how this works. Mm -hmm. So there was some preparation on the team's part. There was time spent by the team with me sitting next to each other um going through some of the things some of the things that would become my tasks yeah i mean that's a lot of responsibility so how do you manage your day-to-day -day operations when it was just cardio group the majority of the things that i had to do were just in my checklist already we were using a system called brevity um, we don't use that anymore i've integrated everything into our firepoint crm including our transaction management so all of my checklists were there and in my calendar. And up until COVID hit, I was still very much using a paper calendar. And I don't know if this is going to show well, but I time block everything. Mm -hmm. um, the entire year, you go through, this goes through January of next year and it's time blocked for the whole year. I wow. take time out in December to do that for the following year because I know when payroll is. I know when we have our marketing meetings. I know when we do our email blast. It's just all in there already. Um, even if it's something that's systematized that I know our CRM is just going to do automatically, I still have the reminder mm -hmm. in my calendar. When mm -hmm. COVID hit and you know we started working from home and then we added virtual leverage and Coach Cotto to the plate, I had to shift that. This was no longer working for me. So I started using an app called Todoist. Mm -hmm. The reason I started using that is because, again, I've got conversations going for Cotter Group, I've got conversations going for virtual leverage. So the minute something comes in, let me backtrack, I've got emails, hangouts, text messages, voicemail messages, phone calls, WhatsApp messages, and people dropping by my office, all related to all the things that we do. So the minute I get a text, an email, or something where it's something I have to do, I click on my to-do list, I add it as a priority for the day, and it's just there. It's never going away until I tell it to go away. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of the day, I go through my to-do list, I rearrange my priorities, things that are not priority today, get shuffled off to another day so that it doesn't scare me, it's manageable. Typically that list shows about 20 things to do a day. Um, some of them are not even reminders for me. They're reminders for the VA or for you or for Jessica, but they're all there. Wow. Um, my goal is to check off at least five of those per day. Wow. Um, and it's also on my phone. It's a live sync. I never have to wonder if something's been done. Um, that's what's keeping me organized right now, to be honest. I've added my personal calendar to it too, mm -hmm. because it makes no sense to me to have two different systems mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. But what has that been like with regards to Cotto Group and me stepping out of production? Did you guys skip a beat? Did we skip a beat? You know, I, I feel like it was more a mental adjustment than an actual physical adjustment to you being out of production because we kept thinking, okay, wait, what does Scott think? Oh, he's not here to ask. Wait, wait, what's Scott gonna, wait, he's not here to ask him. So. It was more of a mental shift for us. And then you you said, listen, I trust you. You guys just, I trust your decisions. Just, just do it. Just go for it. So that solidified for us that we were okay to move forward without having to ask you something every five minutes. A move forward. We made changes. We made decisions. We implemented new events, pop by. And we just, after that sort of mental shift, we just kept going. Mm -hmm. um, it was different, I would say, when we're talking about your sphere, because your sphere had been such a big part of the business, you stepping away meant we really had to extend our efforts to make sure that your sphere was aware that didn't change anything. Cotter Group was still here. Cotter Group was still going to be their realtor of choice. Um, so we just had to up our efforts to make sure that we were in contact with them mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, but outside of that mental shift, I don't think it was as bad as we thought we were going to, it was going to be. Mm -hmm. 
do you have any challenges now, like now that you've been in the role for five years and I've been out of production now that I'm completely removed, what are some of the challenges or what would some blind spots be for mega agents who are thinking on stepping out or going to level six or seven? Um, I think the blind spots, it, it the communication sometimes, especially because it's not just you, it's you and Jessica. So sometimes if you and Jessica are having a conversation and you have this great idea, but then you guys forget to tell me, <laughs> Then that I'm like, I don't know what you're, I didn't prepare for this. I didn't know. So the communication, I think is sometimes a challenge when we're really busy. I mean, that's just a challenge for everyone Mm -hmm. having five minutes to say, Hey, we need to sit down and talk about this. So I think, you know, as of late, we've gotten good about just meeting weekly, same time, Mm -hmm. same day. It's on the Mm -hmm. calendar. And even though we're meeting weekly, we find that we have a lot to talk about. We have a lot to go over. We have a lot to plan. Um, so having that communication, being it, you know, you and I as part of our morning huddle where we were doing it daily and now even just twice a week, that helps. And all of it, all of it, all of it is just about communication. Right. I, I can't know what your expectations are if you and I aren't talking. Yeah. And vice versa. Yeah. Um, and That's then cool. with this market, as far as team goes, the challenge is just, being able to get everyone here at the same time because everyone's so busy and because we do have a high level of account of accountability is making sure everybody's tracking their numbers, sending us their numbers, making sure we're copied on when they're opening an escrow so that we're on top of it from day one. And that's, that challenge just stems from being busy in this Mm -hmm. busy market, Mm -hmm. nothing more. And so now you guys have recently moved to a new market center. You've joined me in La Mirada, um, which was a, you know, I was trying to get you guys over sooner, but our business was in Long Beach. So again, it was another mental block. Like, what does that look like? Most of our clients are in Seal Beach, Orange County and Long Beach. And then we do have clients up to 605. So I know that was a, a struggle, but now that you guys have moved here, it's been great. I would say now I get to see you almost every day, which is nice. And, um, what would you say, uh, what's the goal moving forward? Um, like what, how do you stay motivated now that we've been together for five years? What inspires you and motivates you to keep coming in kind of like what we do to lead generate for new prospects, buyers and sellers, you know, you're, you're a W2 employee. So you know what your checks are going to be every two weeks. What motivates and inspires you to continually come in and do what you do at such a high level? I'm a CS, although sometimes I read like a D, but I like routine. I like continuity. I like knowing what I'm going to do every day. I like having my checklist and knowing that today I'm going to check off six to 10 things off that list. Um, I like some of the repetitive actions that I think high D's and I's hate. I like coming in and being able to go into my CTE and see the status change on listings to in escrow to close and being on top of that. I like coming in and going into my firepoint and checking off things in my transactions. Um, that's just how I'm wired. So for me, every time the agent's have a new escrow you know this week i've been bombarded it's like new escrow new escrow new escrow i'm like i can't keep up but at the same time that's what keeps me here and make sure that everything is on point i you know i was that kid that always had to raise her hand first and sit in the front of the class and get the get the gold star i'm still that kid mm-hmm. so that's what motivates me is being able to come in and do that and know at the end of the day all of this stuff is done all of the transactions are taken care of. This stuff has been taken off of the agents. Today. The agents can go out and get more business. You know, during this pandemic, uh, obviously a lot um, has been, you know, our world, everyone's world has been turned upside down and shaken around. I'm speaking relative to business. How have you guys reinvented yourself this year? And do you believe that knowing that we had to stay at home for the first four or five months, um, can we operate remotely now? In your opinion, we are operating remotely. Um, The one thing where I know that we worry about operating fully remotely is our team culture. Yeah. 
you know, we're a team because we like each other, because we love each other. So only being able to see you through Zoom once a week, that just doesn't cut it for us. Mm -hmm. Um, That's the challenge. Everything else works remotely. I will say being able to sit down in person and go through your deal flow where we can sit here and actively ask questions and look at the contract and things like that, that's a tremendous help versus just going back and forth through emails or Zooms or whatever. You know, when Jessica can come in and go, this is where we are with this listing, this listing, this link, this contract, so on, so on, so on. That knocked out what usually would have taken 10 emails to do. Yeah. So that's the challenges. Yes, we're virtual. Yes, we can do it virtually. As far as shifting and pivoting, you know, the, at the beginning of this, um, our CRM is really good. They load in new uh, drip campaigns for us. So when COVID first started, they loaded in a pre-made drip campaign. We just went in and tweaked it a little, started sending that out with the, the agent's bomb bomb video. And it was a text, it was an email, it was another text. Uh, then there was a phone call. We offered Zoom meetings, you know, how this is affecting the market. What does it mean for you? Some people, some people took us up on it, um, doing a lot more pop by since we still can't do events. Right. Um, figuring out what that means for our holiday event, which we're still, you know, still working on. Um, that's the shift, just trying to figure out. When this started, we thought, okay, in three months, we'll be back to normal. Then we thought in mm-hmm. six months, we'll be back to normal. Now we think it might be another year before we're back to normal. Or this might be normal. normal. Right. So what value can we offer if we're not having events? What, uh, what le- not leverage, I should say, what accountability do you have in your world? How do you stay accountability overseeing multiple businesses, multiple personalities, agents? You know, we're all impatient. We're all drivers. So I know it can be frustrating for someone like you who's wired differently, you know, um, but what, what accountability groups do you have to stay focused and to bounce ideas off that we keep throwing at you? Well, um, there's two things I think that have helped me um, throughout these five years. The first is, you know, we, we are part of a SoCal mastermind group that was created um, before I got here um, out of a group of Gary's top 100. So we've got teams from as far north as Fresno out into Palm Springs, down into San Diego, Ventura. So we cover the entire Southern California region. Um, we all have our sections. We mastermind together, you know, except for this year, um, as a group once or twice mm-hmm. a year. Um, but we also do Zooms. And then the operations people, we're, we were actually the ones who started masterminding regularly. We would try to do it every six months, if not sooner. We could come together and just, we would have an agenda say these are the topics that are most important to us right now. And we could get ideas and what the best practices had been, were for other teams, teams yeah. that are more established. You've got a combination of teams that are newer with a much younger group and teams that are more established with agents who've been in the industry for a very long time. So you have both perspectives. The, the, the teams that are more established, they've got true procedures, checklists that they follow that have never failed them that you can pull from. And then the teams that are much younger, they're a little more innovative in far as marketing and how they leverage their technology. So you get the best of both worlds. Mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. being in that group and being able to give back when they have questions that you can answer if you're like okay I'm actually I actually deserve to be here yeah um and we're and talking then, some pretty big teams too I mean you're oh, talking yeah. about Brian Kane in San Diego Chessie Pagano in Irvine slash uh Mission Viejo area who works with huge developers Hoffman Murphy I mean, these are all hundred million dollar plus producers Right. And um, they're established that, you know, one team has been farming geographically for ages. So we know it works. We just know from them it's a long tail game. Um, Others are have completely different models, but Mm -hmm. all in all, we all can come together and, and figure out, especially, you know, 
on the operation side, it's easy for us to come together and say, okay, look, this is my issue. How do I fix this? Well, I have a list for that or I have a software program for that. And then as far as ownership, you all seem to have the same sort of issues as profitability, PNL. What are you seeing? What's the market doing? Um, it's a great source of referrals. We know that if we're referring someone out, we have some weak trust. Mm -hmm. That's going to take care of them and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I can't, I can't imagine not having that group mm -hmm. around. We email each other all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, right now with all of us trying to implement command, we email each other all the time, trying to figure out who's doing what, what's working, what's not. Um, the other portion that helped, um, and I wasn't initially included by, I, when you started La Mirada, I was, I became um, included in the coaching that we had with um, Ashley. Mm -hmm. Ashley, she was our coach, Jessica and I, and she, her strong suit is keeping us accountable and keeping us motivated and really being able to dig down and see what the issues are. Is it really what it looks like on the surface or is there something deeper? Mm -hmm. And then how do we tackle that? Um, that helped us out a lot. Mm -hmm. Even now, I, you know, I will contact her every once in a while. I'm like, I just need a boost. I need mm -hmm. something. She's mm -hmm. really good at putting everything into perspective, especially with this crazy year that we've had mm -hmm. about, you know, we had this pause. What are you going to do with it? And you sit there and cry, are you going to do something productive with it? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. both of those help me um, in, to stay inspired, stay accountable, um, feel like I'm accomplishing something. I have my checklist. I have my to-do yes. list. At the end of the day, I see how many things I was checked off the list and that makes me feel good. But yeah. these things go just like a step beyond that. Any closing thoughts? I think that was great. I appreciate it. But any... Uh... If there are things that you know you're not good at, you're, it's not your strong suit consider outsourcing it, getting an assistant, finding a, 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 a program that will do it for you if it's just not your strong suit. For me, for example, social media is not my strong suit. I no. post because I have to. No. Um, so for me, that's something that I want you know, to outsource, to have someone else do as long as they understand our brand and do that. So think about your world. What are the things that you, if they're just not your strong suit? and then don't force yourself to do those find a way to make it work for you we got vas who could do that for you if it's social media or tc yeah or cold 1, calling twelve hundred dollars full-time admin cold call. or leverage monica appreciate uh the last 45 minutes um on this interview it's gonna be a great call good good nuggets in there and uh, appreciate everything that you've done for me personally, for my family and for Cotto Group and all of our other business ventures. Couldn't do it without you. Um, so again, uh, thank you very much. And uh, we'll, we'll have to bring you back next year. Oh boy, okay. Recap. Sounds right. good. Okay, terrific. Thank you. All right, bye. All right. Back to you soon, bye.